You went camping alone. A storm rolled in that you were not expecting. But what really has you unsettled is the faint silhouette standing just outside your tent. It's been there for the past hour. You've been too afraid to move. Almost too afraid to breathe. These are allegedly true scary camping stories. Stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Skylight. And remember, to have your stories narrated, share them with us at darkstories.org. The Man on the Mountain From Huck Finn Location, Washington It was the early summer of my senior year of high school. I had just turned 17 and my girlfriend Julie and I had planned a camping trip with some of our friends to celebrate. We were going to be spending the night on Silver Star Mountain, a short drive of where we all lived. We started the day by packing all of the food and cooking materials into my friend's minivan. Then we drove over to pick up the four friends that would be joining us, James, Marco, Ferris, and Sophia. They all pushed their large backpacks into the van and we were on our way. After about an hour's drive on the highway and another 45 minutes on a narrow dirt road, we made it to the remote trailhead. At this point, it was in the mid-afternoon, which was a bit later than we had intended to arrive due to a much-needed river swim we had taken on the drive up. We quickly started our ascent, and soon realized this hike was going to be much harder than we anticipated. While we were all very experienced hikers, we had not prepared for how steep the trail was going to be. No matter, we pushed on, and after two hours of straight uphill climb, we came to a juncture on the trail that was not on the map. After a bit of deliberation, it was decided that I would run up one of the trails and attempt to decipher if it was the right path. I dropped my pack and started to jog up the trail, watching my friend slowly disappear behind me. After a few minutes, I came to the conclusion that this trail was the wrong way. It was a dead end. I had stopped in a small clearing with tall bushes looming above me. I was catching my breath, when I noticed that a spot in the grass had been flattened, likely by a large deer or a goat. Just then, I heard a rustling to my right. It was in the foliage. I could tell that a reasonably large animal was running off into the woods. After that, I was left in utter and unnatural silence. It was time to get going back to my friends. I ran down the trail putting the unusual experience out of my mind. We all picked up our bags when I made it back and resumed our hike, eventually making it to the top of the mountain around 6pm. For an avid hiker, I can say I've seen some extremely beautiful views, but the top of this mountain was the most impressive. It had a 360 degree view of the horizon all around us, with forest stretching as far as the eye could see. The place where we were setting up camp was on the peak of the mountains, surrounded by sheer rocky drop-offs. Since we saw the sun slowly creeping towards the horizon, we put up our tents and hammocks. After a period of time, we were able to build a fire in the stinging cold wind. We ate dinner, and then James, Sophia, Ferris, and Marco went off to smoke a joint on the cliff edge. Jolie and I had decided to stay sober the whole trip. We wanted to fully experience everything here. The sun finally set, allowing us to see the most beautiful sunset of my life. James, Sophia, Ferris, and Marco crawled into their hammocks, which were about a hundred feet from the tent that Julie and I were sharing. After a while of shivering in the cold, I drifted off to sleep with my girlfriend in my arms. I woke up in the middle of the night, I grabbed my phone and looked at it to see that it was three in the morning. I nestled back into my sleeping bag and closed my eyes when I realized why I had woken up. 
There was a faint cry in the distance, a woman's cry. But I soon realized that it sounded more like a man's whimpering somewhere just outside the tent. I immediately assumed it was James. It was only his second time smoking weed, and for some reason I thought he may have been having a bad trip. Without thinking, I left Julie in the tent to go help James out and make sure he was okay. I followed the soft crying to the edge of one of the surrounding cliffs, and I looked down over the edge. I saw a figure crouched into an outcropping on the cliff face. He appeared to be weeping. James, I yelled out. Hey, everything all right? I was still assuming it was him, but there was no reply. Then I decided to do something that I wish I never had. I began to descend the cliff to help him. After about 30 seconds of shuffling down the cliff, I looked again down toward the figure. I noticed that James was not wearing his clothes. How did I not notice that before? I continued to crawl down towards him when he slowly looked up towards me. I was filled with a thickening dread that sunk into the core of my being when I noticed this was not James. Instead, it was some strange, skinny man curled into a ball. Tears were flowing down his face and there was a large rock being held in his hands. I watched in horror as he raised the rock with his right hand and quickly brought it down onto his left hand, smashing his fingers. He then let out a deeply pained groan. Ah! But he continued to do it, over and over destroying his hand. He then lifted up what remained of his appendage, as if to show me what he had done. I had already frozen up, completely terrified of the man ten feet in front of me. He took a short crouched step towards me, still holding what remained of his hand. I began to climb back up the cliff in a panic, kicking rocks and dirt down behind me. <laughs> Another painful groan was released from the man's mouth. I looked back to see the man who was now uninterested in me, continuing to smash his hand to bits. With that, I reached the top of the cliff and yelled for everyone to wake up. I ran towards where everyone was and told them that there was some crazy man on the mountain with us and that we needed to leave. They must have seen the look in my eye because they knew I was not joking. We all began to quickly pack our things when we all began to hear the animalistic screams of pain. Ah! Followed by the sounds of rocks tumbling down the mountain. With that, we grabbed our bags and ran down the trail, leaving our hammocks and tent behind. No one spoke on the hike down, and every so often, we could hear his cries in the distance. As we descended down the steep trail, after an hour we could no longer hear the cries, but still none of us spoke. Eventually we got to our van and discovered the left rear window had been completely shattered, with bits of glass hanging off. We quickly piled into the car and drove off, where I recounted to all of them what had happened on the cliff. Despite how disturbed we all were, we all felt lucky to be alive and eventually started making some jokes about how ridiculous it all was. Once we had cell phone service, I called the police and told them what had happened. To my surprise, they took the case very seriously. They did not find a man on that mountain but they did find a great deal of blood on the cliff face, the very same spot where the man had been. It is now two years later. We all are planning on camping up on the mountain again to prove that we can do it. Despite the excitement that is going along with it, I 
I can't help but feel that this is a very bad idea. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Skylight. Mother's Day is coming up fast, and if you're human and not some skinwalker in disguise, then finding a decent gift can be quite the struggle. Luckily, there's one super cool gift that moms from all over are calling the best gift ever. It's the Skylight, a digital photo frame you can email photos to anytime and anywhere. It sets up in 60 seconds. Adding new photos to it is as quick as sending an email. Just attach and email the photo you want your mom to see and it'll pop up on her Skylight in seconds. It looks like a real photo frame and has a beautiful 10-inch touchscreen so you can swipe through photos at will. She can even press the heart button to let you know that she loved your photo, making it interactive and intimate. If you don't like Skylight, you can get a full refund too, but it's the most personal gift that your loved ones would cherish. Skylight sent us a frame to test out, and it's pretty awesome. We filled it full of photos of our fur babies. I can't wait to get one for my family so I can send pics to my mother or my dad. I might even get one for my brother just so I can surprise him with the most funny and unexpected photos from time to time. As a special Mother's Day offer, you can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight frame when you text DPP to 484848. That's right. To get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight frame, just text DPP to 484848. And that's DPP 484848. Thanks, Skylight. Camp Kismet Climber From The Woodsman Location, Ohio Being a Boy Scout was a huge part of growing up for me. The small Ohio town I grew up in had little to do in it, aside from walk around and stare at the depressing empty buildings left over from the industrial past. Among a few other local organizations, there was a scout troop. I spent a lot of time with that troop, hiking around the dreary local parks, helping the canned food drives, and other things like that. While I have troves of nostalgic tales of camping and nights spent sleeping under the bright stars of the country skies, there are few interspersed memories of unnerving, maybe even horrifying, events. A big part of being a scout is doing community service, and my case was no exception. We picked up trash around the woods, installed new park benches, you name it. We did get a certain kick out of doing stuff around the area. And hey, it beats sitting around all day and doing nothing. Most of the work the local parks had for us to do were just grunt work tasks, like having us hike out to some beat-up backwoods trail, chopping up some weeds, carrying out trash, whatever minute trail maintenance was needed when the park employees had better things to do. When I got an email from some local camp manager in late summer some years ago, requesting our assistance, I was more than happy to organize a small team to go out and help for a day or two. And this job was not unlike the others. We carried in some axes and shovels and got to work on a previously closed old trail, making it look good, walkable. Then we packed it all out. But with this particular job, two things stood out. One was that none of us had ever been to or even heard of the park. This was odd, as we had been basically everywhere in the region. Second was that they had asked us to hike nearly seven miles in, a fairly long distance, especially with tools. Thankfully, they had offered us some lodging, so we would be camping out, provided we could bring a few blankets and the like. No problem. Might as well make a fun time out of it, I thought. I emailed a reply to the manager who'd reached out, and I said we'd be there with a group of five and some tools. A week passed by uneventfully like usual. Soon the time came when I was to load up my truck with a shovel and axe, pick up a friend, and drive out to nowhere. 
We didn't have a huge number of participants in our troop at this point, so it was often up to the members to transport themselves or friends to whatever event they were headed to. Anyway, I picked up my friend Lincoln and we set out toward the park. We met up with the one adult who could spare the time to play the role of chaperone. We didn't really need someone to be there for that, but as per policy, we had to. We grabbed our packs and tools and set down the dilapidated gravel trail toward the camp office. Fifty yards or so into the tree line, we found ourselves passing under a tall gate formed by several cut and grounded telephone pylons, from which hung a beat-up, rotting sign that bore hand-carved letters spelling out, Camp Kismet. When we made it to the camp office, we had thought we were in the wrong place. The small building was ramshackle and nearly falling apart. Glancing into a window revealed an even worse interior, with scattered boxes of files and papers surrounding a heavily disorganized metal desk, lit by a small, dim lamp. We were about to turn around when one of our party noticed a small note on the back side of the building. The note detailed some rather basic directions to the area we were to work on and stay at. The job we had been set up to do was to clear the brush surrounding and growing inside a climbing tower. Strangely, I knew about the layouts of most of the camps in the area, and I had never known this particular one to have a climbing tower. If it did, it would have been one of the only towers in the region. Regardless, we set forth on the walk out. The cabins here were nothing to write home about. Fairly standard, non-insulated plywood walls and some old surplus cots. The tower, on the other hand, was quite strange. A tall and surprisingly thin structure. It by no means looked fit for use. We noted this and hoped that we weren't brought in to clear out the tower for actual use, without any renovations. Judging by the state of the tower and the budget most of the camps in the Ohio area could get their hands on, it would be years before it would be anywhere near safe for climbers. Nevertheless, we settled down for the first night, cooked some canned soup on the dented stove in one of the cabins, and laid down on the stained plastic mattresses that rested upon the squeaky old cots. We were up early the next morning. Breakfast of some bacon and a couple of cans of beans were on the stove by six. Still not awake, I stepped out onto the somewhat shabby front deck to drink some coffee. I sat down on a nearby plastic lawn chair and exhaled deeply. It was to be a long pair of days in the decaying camp, and if we were to make any progress on this mess of a climbing tower, it would take some hard work. Calling back inside to let someone know my intentions, I laced up my boots and began sombering toward the tower. The path there was down another unkempt gravel path that took a wide L shape toward the tower. I was rubbing my eyes as I walked, still not all the way up. Turning the corner and coming into view of the tower in the near distance, I was instantly awake. Because ahead, three quarters of the way up the structure, was a roughly human-sized shape. It had short limbs like a child's, and was not making fast time of the side. There was, to my slight relief, a rope attached to the person's waist, but upon further examination, no belayer was manning the ropes below. In a state of somewhat disbelief, I turned to retrieve some binoculars from my bag. Optics in hand, I faced the tower and raised the binoculars, only to see no such being upon the looming wooden structure any longer. Shocked, I replaced the binoculars and began back toward the cabin. I set my mind to be vigilante over the day's work to try and make light of my morning vision. Back at our camp, I organized the now-awake crew into two teams. Three who would work on clearing the brush on the exterior of the tower, about 500 feet away, leaving me and another scout who we called Knight to work on the inside. Shovels, axes, saws, and rakes at the ready, we made our way down to the tower. 
As we rounded the bend, I half expected to see another figure on the tower, but fortunately, I did not. We arrived at the base of the structure, and each of us set about to our respective tasks. Making my way inside, Knight and I were met with a sight of extremely thick brush growth. Just to get in the tower, we had to work it with an axe and saw. Once inside, we discovered that brush was not the only thing at the base of the tower. A large metal filing cabinet and a long metal trunk stood against the wooden walls. The cabinet read permission slips in bold red letters, and the trunk had helmets sharpied on top. Unsurprisingly, we opened both. The helmet's trunk was empty, but the filing cabinet was not. Inside lay three folders, each dated a year between 1996 and 1998, containing permission forms from some past generation of campers. At the back of the drawer, stuck against one of the metal sides, was a yellowing piece of notebook paper. Picking it up, a small piece flaked off and fell to the ground. I began to read aloud, with the night following over my shoulder. Tom, we gotta get on this. The kid's parents are suing. They want to put us away and say we did it, that we're responsible for him. Our only way out is to say he didn't have his papers and got on without us knowing. Find that kid's form and get rid of it. If they do... Pinning his death on us will be a cakewalk. Johnson. Knight and I looked at each other in shock. Our moment of realization was cut short, with a creak from the top of the tower, and a wispy, nearly inaudible voice. They told us the ropes would keep us safe. We looked up in a near panicked state. Rotting boards from the walls began to fall off one by one, as creaks up the side of the tower rang out as if someone were making their way up the side. The boards crashed into the ground with crunches and clumps. The sounds of creaking from the wooden structure became deafening, until the horrible sounds were all brought to an end by the most grim of all, the sound of a heavy object falling through the air, thudding into the ground alongside the crunch of bones concluding with the soft sound of rope piling up as it fell back down to earth. We hurried out of the tower, thinking someone to be injured, but found no one. Still shocked, we ran toward the group, desperate for an escape from the grim scene we had just witnessed. We found the crew on their way back towards us. I wheezed out an expletive, and the crew asked what was wrong with us, Knight burst out. What do you mean, what's wrong? He turned and waved his arm toward the structure. L Look, the tower is falling apart. The crew had a stunned and confused look on their faces. I turned around and swore aloud as I saw that the tower had no missing boards, no creaking beams, and no fallen climber. After spitting out the explanation, we returned to the cabin and packed our bags. Not one of us in the whole team had not experienced something strange like this, and we had come to trust each other. When we finished, we began moving out. On the walk back, all of us jumped at our own shadows, especially night. We loaded our vehicles with haste and sped off. I haven't heard from anyone involved there since, aside from one email from the same person who sent me the first, oddly thanking us for our help, which we never finished. I've never been back to the area, and I don't think I ever will be. That crunching sound was enough to keep me far away from that camp forever. I shouldn't have waited. From Randoms. Location, British Columbia. The day it all happened was actually pretty nice. The sun was poking through the trees and the odd squirrel chittering off in the distance could be heard. 
I've lived in British Columbia my entire life. Nothing odd or abnormal has ever happened to me. I'm just that weird, quiet teenager that likes to keep to myself. I've always enjoyed taking long walks by myself when camping. It's still my guilty pleasure. On this occasion, my family and I had gone camping at a local lake. It is well known in the area for horse show tournaments, where adults from all places come to drink, smoke, and catch up with old friends or meet new people. The lake is appropriately named Horseshoe Lake, and once you leave the lake, behind it is the Rocky Mountains. It can be a long journey from the lake to the mountains, but where I was hiking, I was only a few miles from the lake. I couldn't hear my campsite anymore out there, but that was fine. It filled me with delight to know that I was on my own. I played around walking for a few miles with my hatchet, looking for a good spot to take a nap or maybe even build a fort. I stopped once I reached a small clearing, not checking my surroundings, as I was comfortable here. I knew every stone and pathway like the back of my hand. I laid down against a missy tree and stared at the sky for a bit. I must have dozed off, because I remember waking up and looking for my hatchet. I grabbed it and rolled over, clearing the sleep from my eyes. I finally stood up and realized the sun was starting to set. I was still quite away from the camp, so I began the trek back to my fire, when I noticed that everything was quiet. I've grown up in the wilderness, and any time an area like this is completely quiet, something is wrong, and though it may seem like the opposite, there is something out there with you. I paused for a while, straining my ears against my hoodie. I was so focused on looking around me that when I took my first step, I ended up tripping over a stump. I started to laugh, reminding myself that I was probably just paranoid. I've never had anything bad happen to me, and to prove myself wrong about my fears that night, I began towards the camp, slower, relaxed, and comfortable. I wish now, looking back, that I had been in a hurry. It was getting darker at this point, and I was starting to smell something terrible. I know that the area is a prime place for cougars. I was worried I had accidentally found one by accident. I looked around for any sort of bone piles or remains. There was no clear trail, and I'm just walking through bushes and trees at this point. I was beginning to get worried. I had no light with me and nothing to defend myself with. I remember thinking I'm so done for if I'm being followed by a cat that size. I stop again, and I can feel that I'm being watched. I can't shake the feeling, so stupidly I turn around and just stare at the trees, crossing my fingers and hoping that there's nothing there. I keep walking, but I felt like if I stopped looking, something would grab me from the darkness. Finally, I found a mark on a tree that I made with my hatchet on the way there. I was close to camp, and I could hear people talking in the distance. I started to run until I heard the sound of the thing that was following me. My paranoia was confirmed. All this time, I had every reason not to hesitate, to run, but I didn't listen. No matter how fast I tried to get back to the campsite, everything seemed slow. I started hearing sticks breaking in the distance. I didn't care. I ran as fast as I could. Finally, I made it past the last hatchet mark and burst into the campsite. I sat down by the campfire, trying and failing to make myself feel safe. It couldn't have been a bear. They don't sound like that, and I don't think it was a bobcat or a cougar. I do not know what was in that forest, but I'm lucky that I woke up when I did. A minute later, and I would have never awakened at all. The Creature in the Woods From Will I live in the UK, 
just up north near the border of Scotland. I was in a Boy Scout group at the time because my parents wanted me to be more active, but I was used to being in the woods. My dad and my granddad would take me and my brothers out there regularly. We went on a seven-day camping trip further up north. The campsite was small and no other group or person was in it. Me and my friend Ollie were in a tent together and we had just finished setting up our tents at about 6 p.m. when the sky grew dark. We ate our dinner, then started a campfire to roast some marshmallows. At about 8.30 to 9 p.m., we were all a bit tired, so we decided to just lay around the fire and stargaze. As there wasn't any light pollution near us, we could see loads of stars. It was at this time that I saw it. I was chatting with Ollie when he suddenly stopped and said to me, Hey, what is that? He pointed towards the sky in between a few stars. There was a glowing red object, shaped almost like a bullet, flying quite fast in a zigzag movement. One of our leaders was a member of the RAF for six years, so he knew that no ordinary human craft could move that way. Bizarre, but cool. We eventually went to sleep after that event. Ollie had been trying to scare me after that, saying they're going to eat our brains, so I was even more paranoid. Later that night, I woke up at 2am. There was a light rain pattering off the tent, but there was another sound behind it. A small grunting sound coming from the forest to the left. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I was shaking, almost in tears. I heard the creature slowly wandering past the tents. Then silence. I eventually fell back to sleep somehow, albeit a terrified sleep. The next morning, I faked sickness to go home, which worked. When the rest of the group returned home, too, Ollie went on about how he heard something the third night I was gone. Something he said sounded like grunting. I told him that that was actually the reason I left. We never spoke about it since that day. Ollie and I still talk sometimes through Discord, but he and I have never brought up the topic again. I still wonder what the strange UFO in the sky was, what the unexplainable noises outside my tent were. I wonder if those two things are connected. I'm keeping a secret from Anonymous G-Ray. I'm 25 and live in Michigan. Five years ago, I went camping alone near Lake Michigan. It was my first time doing so, as I usually brought someone or at least my dog when I went camping. My camping spot was about a nine-mile hike in. It was a very secluded area. I got everything ready, a fire, the tent, and I began to pass the time, reading a book, going for another hike around the area, etc., until I finally came back around nightfall. As I sat by the campfire, trying not to focus on the ominous darkness around me, I heard something strange. It was a really low grunt, and I assumed that it was a deer, a rather large one at that. It was time for bed, so I got into my tent and made sure that my rifle was next to me. I slept a few hours, but I was awakened from a nightmare to a more disturbing sound. It was the sound of something clawing at the tent. I wish it was a coyote like I originally thought. I unzipped my tent and began to try to scare it away. But what I saw instead of a dog-like form was a thin gray creature, a being half as thin as me, 
but twice as tall, disappearing into the darkness of the forest. After a few minutes of just standing there, I ran out of the woods and made the entire hike back that night to get to my car and leave. Camping from Seth W. It was a July night, warm with a chill breeze. I was staying at my friend Aiden's house for his birthday. Our friends Miles and Jason were joining us. We decided to have a faux camp out by putting up a tent in the backyard. We could stay up all night and not disturb the family. We could get pretty loud after all. Earlier in the day, when I first showed up, Aiden told me that his chickens had been coming up missing. So when we were in the tent that night, I remembered him telling me that, and it kind of set me on edge. I started to visualize what could have been doing that to his chickens. But I wanted to have a fun time, not a scary one. So I put it to the back of my mind, and I began to hang out with the guys. Later that night, Aiden's little brother joined us out in the tent. Soon the fire was dying down. We had to use our flashlights or our phones to see. But the feeling of fear and paranoia was welling up again, and I couldn't tell the other guys, because they would just think I was a coward. What I could not play off, though, were the noises I began to hear outside the tent. It sounded like something walking around out there. Jason suddenly freaked out. Right away, he wanted to go back inside. Eventually, he did, but we made sure to take Aiden's little brother with him, just in case. It was 11 p.m. by then, and things were getting more and more disturbing. It was only Aiden, Miles, and me. We had finally distracted ourselves, and we were having fun again until something slammed into the tent. We were all nervous and frightened by then. I was trying to tell myself it was nothing unnatural. By 11.30, things kept happening. The footsteps continued, like something was running through the nearby field. I was getting tired of it and I thought to myself that I'm not going to be this thing's victim or food. I told the others that we needed to go inside, but they insisted that they wanted to go outside and walk around. Were they crazy? Too scared to go alone out there, I had no choice but to go with them. We left the tent huddled and shaking together. We made our way over to the chicken coops, and what we saw there still haunts me to this day. There was a tall figure, all black, with long claws. We screamed and ran back as fast as we could to the house. The rest of that night, I did not sleep. I was ready for that thing to try to come inside the house or to appear at one of the windows, but it didn't, and I never saw it again. Too Close for Comfort From Bilbo, 1776 When I was 15, my parents sent me to a boarding school. During the first week, the school had a camping trip to Glacier National Park in northwestern Montana. There were around 40 of us, all needing a place to set up a tent. I had brought an army-style triangular tent, it wasn't big enough for anything but a person to lay in, with no extra room, and I had to use a couple of cans of sealant to waterproof it. Now, since I was a freshman at the time, I had to help set up the camp, which meant I was one of the last people to pitch my own tent. The sophomore and junior classes took all the good spots in this camp area, while the senior class got their own camp. So, you know, all the spots that had the relatively soft grass or pine needle covering the ground were already taken by the previously mentioned groups. I was stuck pinching my tent on pretty much gravel, more to the outside of the camping area than any of the others. 
I finished preparing my tent and threw in my flashlight, an MP3 player and headphones, my pillow and a sleeping bag, and finally my pocket knife. The first night was normal for a school camping trip. The school deans and the principal checked over all the tents to make sure they were secure. After that, we all helped start a fire and got ready for an evening meal. Following that, there was cleanup, making sure all the food was sealed in bear-proof containers, as well as anyone's deodorants and soaps that they had brought. The next two days were fun, receiving a couple of assignments from the science teacher and the history teacher. Then we explored the park some. We actually saw quite a few bears. Then again, we were a couple of months away from their hibernation period. They were looking for food like crazy, but we didn't have any close calls. I had grown up around forests and was comfortable with all these wild creatures. On the third night, everything was going as usual. I was going to bed, and since we had such an exhausting day of exploring, I fell asleep pretty fast. I woke up at around 1.30 that night. I wasn't sure why. I was immediately on full alert for whatever reason. I never do that. I always wake up groggy and it takes me about 20 minutes to get out of bed. This time, however, something had me on edge. I listened, straining my ears to try and hear if something had a noise to make, the same something that woke me up. There was nothing, though, save for a very low wind. Almost no rustling in the forest, no crickets chirping. As I said before, I grew up exploring the forest, and I also loved walking on well-lit nights. I held my breath trying to hear anything at all. I finally heard it. It seemed to be coming from right outside the tent walls. A hard and heavy breathing. In the next moment... I heard the very slight crunch of gravel under a padded foot. Whatever it was then stopped, sniffing the air only a few feet in front of my tent. I decided like the idiot of a teenager I was, to try to move. I had brought my cloth sleeping bag, thank goodness, rather than the newer polyester lined one that I would have made much more noise in. Now, even with how small the tent was, it did have a small mosquito-netted window. I slowly undid the light flap material that was over it. Then I looked out. Less than ten feet from my tent was what appeared to be a grizzly bear. It wasn't moving much, just turning its head side to side, smelling the air. It seemed to be looking for a particular scent that it had to narrow down before it could move on. I watched the massive beast, and then it stood up on its back legs, and I got a good look at how absolutely huge it was, easily reaching eight feet tall. It was smelling the air still. Then it set itself back down and decided to walk even closer to my tent. It walked right by me, less than a foot away from the side of my tent. I could smell the rank stench off its body. It paused again right there, and my heart nearly stopped. The moonlight that was coming down shone around the beast. Then it turned, its nose pressed against my tent, as if it wasn't quite sure if I was or wasn't the smell it was looking for. I prayed that I wasn't. Then, just as abruptly as I had awakened earlier, the bear left. I hadn't heard any of the heavy breathing like before as it went. I didn't hear or see it turn away. It was like its shadow stayed longer than it did, just to distract me from hearing it leave. My heart was pounding so fast, so hard, I thought I was going to black out. My ears heard my pounding heart every bit of the way, until finally the adrenaline wore off. I fought sleep until it was nearly light. Then I fell asleep then, until one of my classmates jolted me awake with a nudge of his foot through the tent. I cursed under my breath. 
He chuckled at me and said something about me sleeping too hard, then walked away. He had no idea. The final two nights were uneventful, but I still had trouble sleeping, worrying that the bear would be back, this time knowing that what he had been looking for was me. This Man from Allie I was 24. My boyfriend and I had decided to go camping together. We spent the day canoeing, fishing, and doing a lot of other fun things, but I couldn't help but notice that my boyfriend was acting a little strange. He seemed worried, but I never asked why. At about 12.30 a.m., we were finally going to bed in our tent. We got into our pajamas and double sleeping bag, then shut our eyes. The tent was really cold and humid, and the wind outside was all too loud, so I couldn't really fall asleep. After an hour or two, I decided to finally turn around, to face my boyfriend and to change my position to something more comfortable. But I was horrified, paralyzed, when instead of my boyfriend's face, I saw the face of something else. It was a person's head with a blank face. Instead of the usual features of a man's face, there was just flat skin and flesh, like some sort of human egg. I jumped up and nearly screamed, but as my boyfriend woke up and began to wonder why I was acting like that, I looked down at the sleeping bag and the face was gone. It was a horrifying experience, and I know that I was awake. The fear I felt that night, it's hard to describe. A Ghostly Visit While at a School Camp From Anonymous This happened when I was camping with other fourth years of my secondary vocational education. I have to say that ever since I was a small child, I had a fondness for and awareness of ghosts and spirits. I was very interested in the paranormal. I think it was a passion given to me by my mother. Anyway, on to the story. All fourth years went camping and the students from my class got to sleep outside in tents. On the last night, we all decided to sleep outside the tents. As the night went on, the teachers went to bed, and everyone started to feel uneasy, like a collective feeling of dread amongst all of us. Right before we all decided to go to bed as well, I got a familiar chill up my spine, a feeling I had always believed would come to me whenever spirits were around. But this one was different. There was something wrong. Around 8 a.m., a group of classmates who I knew believed in ghosts came towards me, their eyes widened in shock. I'd never seen any of them so pale. Rob, one of them, told me what he saw the night before. He said that night, he saw a soldier in what appeared to be an early 1900s uniform walking around the campsite, occasionally stopping to stare at the kids on the ground. He said he was so horrified that he couldn't move, and when he saw the figure of the soldier just wisp away in the wind, he nearly blacked out. Even after we left that camping ground, I continued to feel that dreaded icy cold. I was afraid that at any moment, something would reveal itself to me, something that attached itself to me at that campsite. Even today, I sometimes feel an odd and random chilling cold creep up my spine, like an echo that's only there to remind me of the horrors of that campsite. I never want to go back. Bathroom Ghosts from Anonymous I used to go camping in the Catskills with my father. After a weekend of fun, we took down the tent and packed up the car. But before we left, I felt the urge to use the restroom. 
Although I was young at the time, I didn't want to relieve myself outside in public, even if we were at a wooded campsite. It was midday, and I knew there were other people nearby. My father dropped me off at the campground facilities, then he went to wait in the car. I asked him to come with me, but he refused. I went to the bathroom and headed over to the only urinal. The bathroom had two stalls, a sink, and a urinal, and I was the only one in there at the time. I had this thing about lowering my head and always checking the stalls in public bathrooms, and I didn't see any other people. I was about to let loose when I heard this whispering sound. It was coming from the last stall. Although no one was in it, there was this whispering in some language that I did not understand. I got to the point where I was too scared, so I held it in and I left. I have no idea what I heard in there, or what it may have been from. But if it meant avoiding it, I was glad to be tortured all the way home from a full bladder. Consider this last story a little bonus story. I read this tale October 10th of 2018 to a very small reception, so odds are most of you may have never heard it before. In that case, enjoy. This is what happens when you wear headphones in the woods. From Matilda J. Call me weird or accuse me of defeating the purpose, but whenever I go hiking or camping, I bring a pair of Sony headphones and my smartphone to watch my favorite YouTube channels and maybe some Netflix or Hulu. Sure, I've nearly walked into a tree a few times, but when you work 12 hours a day, four days a week, it can be difficult to find all the time you need to catch up on the videos you enjoy while also finishing errands and getting outside. The thing is though, I haven't gone outside wearing headphones for the past year now and I don't think I ever will again, because something happened to me that was so traumatizing, I nearly never went back in the woods at all. It was July 7th of 2017. I had planned to camp out that day as I had Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays off. It was supposed to be simple and fun. Leave Friday evening, enjoy a Saturday in the woods alone, and come home Sunday so I could get enough sleep for another 12-hour shift on Monday. By 4.30 p.m. that day, I had everything packed, and all my errands had been run for the weekend. It was time to get outdoors and catch up on an overflowing subscription feed near a crackling campfire. Up in those mountains, things are always quiet. I live very close to a highway in the city, so you can imagine how much of a respite it is for me to relax in a place where you can actually hear your ears ringing. I hiked for half an hour before reaching my pre-planned campground, a small clearing surrounded by tall conifers. There was shade and plenty of moist leaves on the ground, and to me, that was perfection. I began to pull the bag off of my back and unroll the tent. As I was setting up my nylon shelter, I suddenly froze. I felt something, a strange sensation on the back of my neck. It felt like breathing. Counting down in my head, three, two, one. I then turned around. All I saw around me was forest, empty, silent forest. I sighed and rubbed the newly formed goosebumps on the back of my neck. I then turned back toward the unfinished tent. That was weird. It was all I had to say about it. The sun was setting by the time the fire was going. It crackled in front of me my back to the trees and the tent on the opposite side. I had a single headphone over my head, the other hanging toward the back of my scalp. I was finally able to relax and enjoy myself. I pulled up my subscription feed on the YouTube app, then I kicked off my nighttime bug repellent fueled binge. First up was Dude Perfect. I can't remember the precise video it was, but I do remember just letting it play for a while. I was soon distracted from my sub-feed 
and ended up watching overdramatic bottle flip videos. That's YouTube for you. But that peace didn't last long. I must have been watching videos for about 40 minutes when I found myself petrified, motionless, frozen to my sitting position. I was supposed to be alone in these woods. I hadn't invited anyone out here, nor had I told anyone that I was going camping this weekend. So, when I felt it, I felt like my heart was going to evaporate. There were hands creeping over my shoulders. I remember thinking in my panic, who and why? I remember thinking how much I regretted pointing my back toward the woods. Whoever these hands belonged to, they were icy cold. Every centimeter of their dry, cracked flesh stung like tiny angry waves of red ants. Somehow, I could not move, or I just simply refused to move. In the back of my mind, I knew that jumping or turning around all of a sudden would force my attacker into view, and at that moment, I did not want to see who or what those hands belonged to. They creeped over my shoulders until they were coming down toward my chest. By then, I could see pale white skin and yellow chipped fingernails. They scraped over the outside of my plaid shirt. Nothing had ever felt so gentle, yet so treacherous at the same time. Its movement along my shivering body left a trail of goose flesh. Seconds later, there was a new sensation on the back of my neck, a sensation that was terrifyingly similar to breathing, except these breaths were cold and dry. What must have been 20 seconds spanned eons. Every palpitation of my heart felt like a battering ram against my trembling ribcage. What was I supposed to do? What would a person do in that situation? when they missed the opportunity to jump away, when they allowed themselves to be encompassed by an unseen entity in the middle of miles upon miles of wilderness. Shaking violently now, I began to flex my arms. I lifted them slowly, my target the headphones on my head. I will remove them, I thought, and then ask my invader what they wanted from me. My heart pounded somehow harder now, only a few more inches, and then my hands would meet my headphones. The sound of the video playing on my smartphone had now been drowned out by the red noise of blood rushing through my veins. My hands finally met my headphones. I reminded myself I just had to yank them off. Another countdown. Three. Two. One. I tugged the plastic arch from my head and jumped over the campfire in one spry motion. Turning toward my previous resting place, I breathed in hard. Where I was once sitting only remained struggling shadows lapping at the light of the flickering campfire, and beyond that, trees swayed only just barely in the light wind. What? I breathed out loud. Was it a dream? My mind raced to capture an excuse, but I could find none. After the denial, I found anger as I berated myself, wearing headphones in the woods assuming I was completely safe. If I hadn't been deafened by these headphones, I would have at least heard the assailant enter my camp. But what assailant? Whoever they were, they were gone now, leaving me flustered and considering the idea of just abandoning my weekend plans. I crawled into my tent and sat facing the small opening, the fire still brightly alive in front of me. I stayed awake and aware for the next two hours. It took me that long to convince myself that what I just experienced was just a hallucination or something. Yeah, just a hallucination brought on by exhaustion from the long work week and treacherous hike and aided by me wearing headphones to listen to miscellaneous tripe on the internet. Having thoroughly persuaded myself that there was nothing to worry about, 
I laid back, still facing the opening of the tent, where the fire could be seen outside. Then I went back to taking in my subfeed. Shane Dawson began to pour in through my headphones. I was warm, comfortable, and entertained. It was only a matter of minutes before I fell asleep. I don't know what woke me up. My right hand was still propping up my smartphone, which by then had strayed quite far from my subscription feed again. I must have been out for an hour or so. It was still dark out. Actually, it was darker now, as the flames of the fire that once imbued my tent with warmth and a secure glow had died down to not more than orange radiating embers. It gave off some light, though, enough light for me to see that I was not alone. I held my breath. The sound of me breathing in would surely give me away. That is, if they didn't already know I was there. Sitting on the opposite side of the campfire was a small, feminine figure. She seemed to shake a bit every few seconds. Because of her dirty, mud-covered hair hanging in front of her face, I could not make out much more than her kneeling, quivering shape. She wasn't wearing clothes, from what I could tell, but the mud on her body had long since dried, forming a body paint-like covering about her. She could have been looking at me, and I wouldn't have been able to tell. Realizing that my headphones were still on, I quietly removed them and realized that it wasn't as silent as it appeared. Every time the girl shook, she moaned a raspy cry. She had been sobbing this whole time. This dirty, strange little girl was in my camp sobbing in the middle of the forest. My fear subsided for a moment. Human instinct kicked in as I wondered if this poor girl needed help. Perhaps she was the source of my fears from before, and my sudden jump had scared her back into the woods. Driven by guilt and anxiety, I pulled myself up, placing my smartphone and headphones beside me. But when my shoulder rubbed against the side of the tent, her face immediately cocked up. She was looking straight at me. Her face shone clearly in the ember's glow. I screamed. The girl had only eyes. No mouth, no nose, just eyes that poured tears over her far too smooth face. I was crawling backward now, hitting the back wall of the tent. I ended up tearing a hole through it to get away desperately from her. Clumsily, I got myself stuck in the hole, and I struggled for a bit before standing outside the remnants of the shelter. I turned toward the girl, but she was gone now. She had disappeared, yet her cries remained in the air. They echoed distantly through the trees around me. The sobbing now sounded as if it were miles away. There was no possible way I could make sense of this situation, and all my mind could compel me to do was flee, escape. So I gave in. I made it back to my car without any further incidents, without any further life-shattering sounds or sights. Relief was the only sensation left in me. Everything was numb now. I just wanted to go home. After this experience, I'd need a whole new weekend just to escape this failure of a weekend. As I climbed into my car and put the keys into the ignition, I looked up. No, I didn't see the girl again, nor did I hear her anymore. But that was when I did realize something. I'd forgotten my phone and headphones in my rush. The ruins of my tent were there too, an epitome of my experience. I floored the gas pedal and didn't let up until I made it home. I haven't planned any further trips into the woods, and the most I've done is hike on already busy hiking trails, and one thing I no longer do is wear headphones outside. Call it a nonsensical phobia, but I think it's more than that. Take this as a warning. If you ever find yourself in the woods listening to something in your headphones, be careful. You're never quite alone. And if you ever stumble upon a quickly abandoned campsite, 
with an old pair of Sony headphones lying there, turn around and leave. Leave before you hear her crying. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you enjoyed these reasons to avoid camping, but if you're anything like me, there are reasons why I don't go camping enough. I love fear. I love getting scared like the rest of you. And then again, one thing I don't think I'll like is being chewed and devoured alive from within four nylon walls. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a like, share the episode, comment, and subscribe. If you want to share your own story to have it narrated, send it to us at darkstories.org. If you want to support the show, you can donate on Patreon at patreon.com slash darkness prevails. Or you can browse our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails. Now then, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode about three bizarre monster attacks in the Appalachian Mountains. I Eat Wood Spork says, I have a suggestion for a future video. You should rank your favorite and scariest creatures that you've gotten stories for. That would be fun. Would I be reading and ranking actual stories about those creatures? Or talking about the creatures themselves? Let me know in the comments. Kane Tufton says, My dude, just as I needed you. Yeah, I have a tendency to put out videos at the right time. That's because I'm watching you through the window at every second of every day. And yeah, I know about that weird mole. Dimitri Vlad says, The monsters will make you squeal like a pig. Oh, that scene. It collectively terrifies and disturbs all dudes. Ellie Hernan says, I'm going to Ohio in the summer, and I have to go through the Appalachian Mountains. Well, everyone press up to pay respects to Ellie Hernan. They were good people. And Jerrica Hacking says, I should be writing my paper, but this seems more important. Unless your paper's about the Appalachian Mountains, of course. You people and your procrastination. That used to be my middle name way back in high school. How the heck I graduated at all? I have no idea. Well, that brings us to the end of today's episode. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are on the way soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing and beautiful patrons. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one. Strange one. Strange one. Strange one.